but my time goes in the beginning and I can't get it all finished and this is a heavy, heavy lesson because we're going to climb Mount Sinai, we're going to go through the Red Sea, we're going to, we're going to travel the universe tonight. So I just hope pretty soon everybody will be seated. Uh, <laughs> I've been taking off for years. <laughs> Susan, where's Matthew? He had a okay. Well, while we, we're waiting, I do want to tell you, if you want to know how to get online, all you have to do is go to YouTube, go to the search bar, and put in Gaston Community Church. After that, their sermons will come up and this teaching will come up. I don't know. Tom, when is it posted? Uh, each week. Okay. Okay. So if we do tonight, then it's it's up by Sunday morning. By tomorrow. Well, I'm I'm already in Sunday morning. Um, so okay, and then they can pull it up and listen to it. Okay, because a lot of people can't come tonight, and they want to be sure and and do it on YouTube. Uh, well, while we're waiting, I'm going to ask Susan to come up, and she's going to lead us in this song. If you want to sing with us, that would be great, but sing it as a prayer, because that's actually what God is doing with the Israelites, is preparing them and all of us to be a sanctuary, a place for God to dwell. So Susan, this is Susan uh, Hanks, and she was in my in CBS with me on administration. I attract administrators, and I thank God I do. Okay. We got no mic. That's okay. Wait a minute. You want this one? Okay. okay. Lord, prepare me, me to be a sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving. I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Thank you, darling. In the name of Jesus, let's bow our heads. We have not stopped giving thanks for you, O Christ, remembering you and remembering each of you in my prayers that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give all of you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in your knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your hearts may be enlightened, that you may know the hope of his calling and the riches of his glorious inheritance in the state. Holy Father, we are standing on holy ground as we come to you with humble hearts. We ask that you fill each of us with your Holy Spirit. And Father, give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and hearts to perceive the love that you have for each one of us that you would want to tabernacle in each one of us. In the name of Jesus, empty me, fill me with your Spirit, overflow me with your love. And Father, give me the power of the Holy Spirit, which is the resurrection power of Jesus. Christ that raised him from the dead. Perfect that which concerns me, and Father, remind me that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Uh, let's open up. Let me let me get my... Uh, I mean, here it is. Okay. We, we don't need to go there. Let's keep going all the way across. I'll tell you when to stop. Okay, let's stop right. Let's stop right here. Let's stop back. Go back to Jacob and Leah. You remember that Jacob and Leah. Jacob is uh, one of the patriarchs, and you remember that there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Do you know though that when Jacob's name was changed to Israel, that was the first time there were Israelites. So his sons became the Israelites, and he, his wives were Rachel and Leah. And remember that Leah was the wife he did not want, 
and he worked seven years thinking he was going to get uh, Rachel, and God gave him Leah, and he was very unhappy with her, worked seven more years to, to get to marry Rachel. But if you'll see that God gave the tremendous inheritance to this, to this woman, Leah, and she birthed Reuben, Judah, Dinah, Simeon, Issachar, Levi, and Zebulun. And you will notice Judah, I enlarged, I enlarged Levi, and I want you to notice Joseph over here. These are three of the most important people in Scripture that we're going to be dealing with in the future. All right, last week, go on, go to the next one, honey, please. All right, we talked about Joseph in his dream and his arrogance, etc. And then we're going to move to the next one. And we see that at the end of Genesis, Genesis 50, 20, we see that the brothers are scared now that Jacob is dead or Israel, that the brothers are going to be mistreated by Joseph. But if you'll read Genesis 50, 20, he says, am I in the place of God? And he said, Satan meant this for evil, but God meant it for good, for the salvation of many. In other words, all his suffering, everything he went through was worth it because God broke a, a very arrogant young man at 17 and took him through many schools of suffering and then brought him and moved him from literally the bottom of the pile to the second most powerful man in Egypt. And this is the way God will do with you. If you'll allow him to humble you, he will do great things in your life. Last week, I made a list of all the principles of God. And when I give you a principle, it's something that is eternal. It means that God always works this way. So I'm going to, you. they're out there in week three, because I do them right after this course. In week two, the principles of God are these, that you need to be discerning about sh telling people what God has said to you. Joseph was very immature. When God spoke to him and gave him the two dreams, he immediately shared them with his brothers, and they hated him for that. Secondly, a calling involves breaking and suffering to form the character that God needs for his mission. If you are serving God in any capacity as a preacher, teacher, whatever, you probably started many years ago with God breaking you and causing you to go through many trials and tribulations because he cannot use somebody that is, is filled with pride. And do we have a lot of those in the pulpit today? God can work all things together for good. Everything in your life, no matter what it is, how bad it's been, can work together for good. Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for good for those that love God and are called according to his purposes. What is God's will for your life? The will of God is that you be conformed to the image of Christ. So in your suffering, God is going to bring you to look like him. That is his purpose for you. You think his purpose is all these superficial other things in life, it is not. He wants, God wants you to look like his son at the end of your life, that you've walked with him and talked with him, been filled with his spirit, and become and look like Jesus. Number four, callings can come early in life or late. You saw that Joseph was called at 17. Moses, it took 40 years to break Moses. He had been 40 years in Egypt in the world, and then at 40, when he murdered he, uh, one of the men, he was exiled to Midian, and he, he married Zipporah, had two sons, and worked as a shepherd, which was about the lowest class thing you could do. So God took him down to take him up. He took them out of Egypt to take them in. When God takes you out of something, he wants to take you in to something else. So don't be discouraged. If he calls you out, he's going to call you in to something else. The higher the calling, the more the suffering. Suffering caused the Israelites to multiply. Remember last week I told you that as soon as Joseph was forgotten in Exodus 1, that we see that the Pharaoh did not know Joseph. He had forgotten who he was, even though he'd saved the whole civilization of Egypt and had fed them bread for seven years and stored grain for them, etc. He forgot him, and he saw the Hebrews multiplying. He thought, oh my goodness, they'll go with another 
country or another military group and defeat us, so I'm going to put them into slavery. Uh, God broke Moses from his self-sufficiency and isolated him in the desert for 40 years. He will do the same with his leaders till they learn to depend on him. God is in the uh, forming you to look like his son, but he is, he is also wants you to learn to depend on him. God is not into independence. God is into dependence. So he will do whatever it takes to make you lean on him. An example, he took the Israelites through the Red Sea. He delivered them. He redeemed them. It was type of baptism. But when he brought them out in three days, he took them in the desert. They had no water. Then they had no bread. They had no meat. They had nothing. What he did was start taking them aside and making him be the all-sufficient God. And he'll do the same with us. If you belong to God and trust him, he will fight for you. He says, stand still and see the salvation of God. He said, I will fight for you. You just keep your peace. Lastly, God chooses his leaders and trains them. Moses was 40 years in training. It is usually a long process. This is a true leader of God, not some of the people that you see today that have barely known God and, you know, have a three-point sermon. Uh, now, let's move uh, to the Jacob and Leah lineage. And we see that Jacob, of course, was the third patriarch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Uh, he married Leah. And this is the lineage that's going to be so important when we go into the tabernacle. They were from the tribe of Levi. Levi had three sons, Gershom, Koath, and Merari. And you need to remember these names because they all are priests. And especially those three. They had particular jobs in the tabernacle that nobody else could do. Y'all remember when David brought the uh, Ark of the Covenant, was coming into Jerusalem, and the ox cart was unsteady, and Uzzah reached and touched the cart and died? Well, people say, isn't that a cruel God? Why did he do that? Because he had a standard, and only certain people could touch the Ark of the Covenant. And another a very interesting thing that I read and I believe when I studied it was that when we tried to touch the plan of God, sometimes we're going to, we could die. Sometimes we get involved in our children's lives in ways we should not be. We enable them. We give them too much money, too much, uh, and not enough time. But I'm telling you, God is saying, do it my way. I set up the rules for this. And so David disobeyed. He knew better than that. He knew that only one tribe could carry that ark, and it was the Kohathites. Look at the children of the Kohath group, Amran and Josabed, and guess who they birthed? Aaron, Moses, and Miriam, and Moses was the baby. Now, Aaron had four sons. Aaron becomes the high priest, and these four sons become the priests after him and serve with him. You'll notice the number five. There's Aaron and four sons make five, and you're going to see the number five, the number seven, so many times in the tabernacle. If you know numbers in the Bible, you'll see that five is the number for grace, Seven is the number for perfection, maturation, uh, <clears throat> and there goes my voice again. Henry, I drank tea before I came. It's not going away. Don't worry. <laughs> my voice will come back. Okay, so he had, did you notice it already came back? Look how quick. Um, so here's Aaron and the four sons. All right, would you go to the next slide, please? All right, we're going in now to the call of Moses. And we talked about this last week. But remember, he was sent out in the desert for 40 years to be broken. And God could not use Moses in the arrogance of the Egyptians. Uh, he was worldly. He was arrogant. He did not listen to God. He didn't do what God told him to do. He did things his way, sort of like Frank Sinatra. I do things my way. Uh, but God broke him in those 40 years, tending sheep. 
And so when he called him, he said, take your shoes off. This is Exodus 3. This is holy ground. And he took his sandals off. And out of that bush, which was not unusual, it was burning in the desert. It's never unusual because often the heat and all would cause the bushes to break into fire anyway. But this was different. A voice came out of there. And that voice says, I am who I am. That's who's calling you. And remember, we know the names of God so far. We saw the first one with Jehovah Roy, who's the God that sees when Hagar was sent in the desert with Ishmael, and God saw her plight. And by the way, she didn't forget, he didn't forget Ishmael. Later, he had a very strong tribe, but certainly he was not the promised son. Then we saw Jehovah Yira, which was God is a provider. We're going to talk about his provision of bread tonight, quail, and the provision of water. And then we're going to see that uh, his name, I am that I am. I want to read you what that means because this is critical for us to understand who God is. When God says, I am who I am, of course, that's first person singular of, the, of an irregular verb. And I believe I'm correct. I may be wrong, though. It's been years since I looked this up. Every language has the to be verb irregular, I think, but Turkish. But every other verb, I am, you are, he is, you are, he are, uh, we are, you are, they are. It's an irregular verb in all the Romantic languages that I know. But I know that I think Turkish is the only one it is not irregular, which is an interesting fact. Now, here is who God is. I am the ultimate statement of self-sufficiency, self-existence, and immediate presence. God's existence is not contingent upon anyone else. His plans are not contingent upon any circumstances. He promises he will be what he will be. That is, he will be eternally constant God. He stands ever-present, unchangeable, completely sufficient in himself to do what he wills to do and what he wants to accomplish. Now, understand this, that so much of the world's idea is I'll help God or I don't need God. For example, some of you studied this wonderful poem, which I thought was wonderful at the time. I wasn't even born again, but listen to this. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishment the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. That is not true. That is someone that has their own self-sufficiency and thinks they can do all things through themselves. God will break a person to bring them to the end of themselves so that they will be totally dependent on him. And that's exactly what he did with the Israelites. Here's another one. You know this one by Frank Sinatra. For what is a man, what has he got? If not himself, then he has not. To say the things he truly feels and not the words of one who kneels, the records show I took the blows and did it my way. He sure did, and his life was a mess. A total mess. Um, so here's the I am. He calls Moses to himself, and he begins to give him his instructions. Tonight, we're going to talk about how God speaks to you. We're going to talk about how God breaks people. And that doesn't sound like good news, but I can tell you something. You're not really usable until you're broken, until you realize that you have no sufficiency of your own and that you need God and that without him, John 15, you can do Nothing, not all things. You can do all things through Christ who strengthens you, but you can do nothing without God. You say, well, I taught college, I taught high school, and when I came into Christ, I started teaching Bible. But not every person that teaches school begins to teach Bible, and a lot of them wouldn't want to. But I can tell you from the time God called me at 33 years old, I have been broken, and he has called me out of clubs, of meetings, of anything I was doing, and he got me into studying, and I studied under some of the best teachers. I studied under um, Lloyd Ogilvie. I've studied under the Octomires. I've studied under so many people, 
by teaching myself the Word of God. But tonight we're going to talk about how important is that Word of God. And I had to memorize this Word, and I'm not even a Baptist. You know, the Baptists really know and, and have all these contests and know the Word of God. I was a Presbyterian. I knew John 3.16. And that was about it. But, you know, that's about the best verse you can know in the whole Bible. So it worked fine for me. All right. So we see that I am who I am. Moses then is sent back to Egypt. After he's broken, then he's qualified to go back and bring his people out. God called him the meekest of all men. And he also said he was a friend of his. God called two people his friend in Scripture, and they were Moses and Abraham. Also, he calls you in John 15 his friends. You are my friends. But what if you obey me, if you do what I ask you to do? An indication of your love of God is always obedience. He can call you, but if you're not going to obey him, and delayed obedience is disobedience. You say, well, I heard God, but I didn't do that. I, I, I waited till it suited me. Well, guess what? That doesn't count in God's economy. All right, we're moving now to back over to Exodus 16. And by the way, in that same chapter of chapter 3, we see that God begins to pay for the tabernacle. God's plan of raising money is not the churches. And this is going to make people mad, but I've made people mad before. It doesn't matter. So what I'm going to say to you is that he plundered the Egyptians and got the money for the tabernacle. They had been in bondage 430 years, and God said, Now, the night before the last plague, number 10, which is of the firstborn, he said, I want you to go to all the Egyptians' homes, and I want them to give you silver, gold, jewels, bronze, etc., everything they have. And by the way, when they start building the tabernacle, God has them bring their offerings. They're called free will offerings. And he says, now, I don't want you to give unless you really have a heart to give. And do you know they gave so much that God had to say, do not give anymore. Can you imagine a church telling you not to give anymore? You've given too much. Well, that's the way God does things. And I have to say that there's this church in Charlotte. The, I think it's Good Shepherd Methodist. I attended there one time. And they built the first building they went in debt for. But after that, God talked to the, the pastor and said, I don't ever want you to be in debt again. He said, you're going to have to build this yourself. They raised the money. They've never had to borrow a dime since then. In fact, and I know another church right now that they've only been in existence three times. They will not borrow money. And they've given away $5 million already in three years. And that's from the congregation feeling that God has said they don't ask for money during COVID. They didn't even put out a, a sign saying, we need your money. They just said, don't forget that, you know, we have to have something to keep this church running. And the people just gave more than they'd ever given before. When God moves on your heart, when you belong to God completely in Romans 12, when you give your heart to God, he gets your pocketbook. And he wants everything. He doesn't just want you. He gets it all. And people that really serve Christ, really serve him with all their hearts, they are surrendered to Christ. And that's what this course is about. Knowing God, dwelling with God, and knowing what God wants with your lives. All right, we go now to, we go to Exodus 15. And I talked about this last time, and the reason I'm bringing this up again is because the Israelites could not go forth if they kept bitterness in their hearts. And their trial showed that they were bitter people. They had already crossed over through the Red Sea. God had defeated the Israelites. He had given a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night to guide them. And they were three days out of the Red Sea and the most magnificent deliverance you or I could imagine. And in three days, they came to the pool of Marah, and it was bitter. And they, I told you it was probably magnesium. And they started complaining immediately. Isn't it unreal how we forget quickly what God has done for us? And, and you know what? Wait till we get to chapter 16 of Exodus. And when God is 
starting to feed them manna and quail, and they begin to say, we, I, we wish we had never gone through the Red Sea. You have treated us so badly. We want to go back where they treated us wonderfully. They had forgotten that they were slaves and in bondage and treated terribly, and even they took all their, they gave them no straw for, to make the bricks. They did all these things, but their memories were short. Let me tell you, sometimes you think back in the past and you think, Things were so much better then, but they might not have been. You just may have remembered it that way. All right. So Jehovah Rapha is the name God he is the healer. And what happened here in Exodus 15, as you know, they came out, they drank, they hated the water. And, and what did Moses do? He went to get a tree and he brought it and threw it in the pool of marrow, which means bitterness. And that tree was represented the cross. And guess what it did? It sweetened the water. Y'all, life is sweeter through the cross. It is only the cross where you will see the light. And it's also the cross where Christ died for you, shed his blood, and brought you into the kingdom of God. And there's only one way into the kingdom, and it's through Jesus Christ. You're going to see when we open up the tabernacle, there's one gate, and there's one way you can get in, and if you crawl over in any way, you're called a thief and a robber, and God will kill you instantly in the old tabernacle. I mean, they, there was no way. There were so many restrictions because God was such a holy God, and they were such unholy people just like we are that they, he had set his boundaries and he made sure he even killed two of Aaron's sons, as y'all know, just like that. He said, well, that's a mean God. No, it's a God. It's the God. And he can do what he wants to, when he wants to, how he wants to, at any time. There's not enough fear of God in this country. And there's not enough fear of God in the church. And I'm telling you that because it's not a, a being so scared of him. It's reverencing who he is. He is the I am who I am. And it's I am who will send you. It is I am who will save you. It's I am that will redeem you. It's the I am that will sanctify you. And it's the I am that will take you into heaven. And don't you forget it. You won't get there any other way. So what do we do about bitterness? He puts the, cro he puts the tree in there, the cross. And by the way, I think that's 2 Peter 5. And to cause the tree a cross. And I'll... No, that's your holy priesthood. I beg your pardon. Go to the next one, please. All right, we're going to talk a minute about bitterness because I don't want you or anybody else to have a root of bitterness. In Hebrews, it says that if you're not careful, for example, if you don't forgive people and you hold grudges, a root of bitterness can take root in you and can make you a very critical, very unhappy person. I put out there many, many handouts about bitterness. And tonight I'm dealing with that because bitterness is something that as you get older, <clears throat> when you go to, say, an assisted living or whatever, and nobody wants to be with you, and, and you sit around and complain about everything, you probably have a root of bitterness. But here's the thing. God does not want you to be bitter. And I know life can be very hard. And I know we know that God is sovereign, and from him, through him, and to him are all things, chapter 11, 36 of, of Romans. But I want you to see here what bitterness can do. It will grieve the Spirit of God. Such a spirit makes us hard and cold and difficult to live with. Have you ever heard about uh, people talking about their parents? His mother's never happy about anything. And daddy, I, I just can't please him. I can't do this. I can't do that. All right, it turns us into people who are negative and critical. If you have a negative spirit and you're constantly critical, you have a root of bitterness. If you can't find anything right with your husband or your wife, you have a root of bitterness. It makes us resistant to God's plan and his love for us. Lastly, it destroys us the way acid eats through the container in which it is held. Uh, more than that, I have given you several other things about bitterness. But what I would like to do right now is I would like to have you stand 
what did they say in the church? All who can or are able stand. Well, stand. <laughs> okay, let's get rid of any bitterness before we go on tonight, because I know some of you have bitterness in your hearts. Let's bow our heads right now. Lord, would you reveal the bitterness in my heart or anybody's heart here? Father, I'm asking you to take that bitterness and t show us the truth. Is there somebody in our lives that we have not forgiven? Is there some parent, some child, some uh, mate, some friend that has hurt us and we have been bitter about it for years and we have not been able to forgive them? So, God, I ask you to reveal it tonight. Number two, God, I ask that you give us the grace that you let us be able to forgive. If we don't forgive, you do not forgive us. I bring myself to you, Lord, and I ask that anybody I have ought against, I would forgive. And I do that by the grace of God. We do it by the very grace of God. Father, you have made a way through your cross for us to forgive all people. We are unable to forgive without the blood of Christ, without the cross of Christ. For some reason, you who were perfect forgave every one of us for every trespass, every sin that we've ever committed. So, Father, I'm asking tonight that you give every person here the ability to forgive whomever for whatever in the name of Jesus. And lastly, Lord, I ask that you replace that bitterness tonight with the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, uh, Father, self-control. We cannot do this on our own. So I ask you, God, in the name of your Son, Jesus, that you give us the power through the power of the Holy Spirit to forgive anyone that we've had ought against, to cleanse us, to forgive us, and to, Father, to fill us afresh with your Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, there's some more handouts in there, and there's some more results of bitterness. Now, after this happened, this is so interesting. God said, now my name is Jehovah Rapha. So now we have four names of God that we've been dealing with. What are they? Jehovah Roy, Jehovah Yera, Jehovah I am who I am, and now Jehovah Rapha, the God that heals. This is again Exodus 15. Here's the thing. God says here, if you will heed my voice and if you will keep my statutes and my commandments, I will not put any of the diseases on you I put on the Egyptians. But that's a conditional covenant, isn't it? If you do this, then I'll do that. Now, one thing that God does all the way through Scripture is he tries to talk to his people. If you will heed my voice, if you'll hear what the church is saying, if you'll do this, and today the church will tell you in seminaries too that you can't hear the voice of God. You can hear the voice of God. God speaks. He is always speaking. He speaks in nature. He speaks in creation. He speaks through friends. He speaks through churches. He speaks through sermons. He speaks through the Word of God 99% of the time. Now, interestingly enough, in Greek, there are two words for word, W-O-R-D, rhema, and logos. They mean the same thing, but they are not the same thing. The difference between the two is that rhema is a bucket of water and logos is the whole well. The whole word of God, 66 books, is a logos. It's the wisdom of God. It's a general word of God. But then the rhema word is that word that God has given you. Say that you're doing your devotions that day, and then all of a sudden God just speaks to you, and, and something jumps out at you. That is a rhema. I was teaching John, my cousin, the other day about a rhema. Have you had many rhemas since then? Have you ever learned this before? No. You never heard of it in your church either, have you? Okay, let me just show you what happened today. I got up to do my devotions, and I knew where we were going to start. We were mainly going to start with Exodus 3, and I am who I am. And here was my devotion, experiencing God, and here is the word that came out. He said, I am. This is the word for today. 
God replied to Moses, I am who I am. This is who I am. To say, that is who I am to say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. Now, this is the same word I was to start tonight. He confirmed it by giving me that very devotion. And he says, God's answer, I am, that is Moses, I'll be whatever you need me to be if you will carry out my assignment. Now, when I started to say when Moses asked me to teach here <laughs> at Community Church, when Jesse Bone, when Brian Alf and Jesse Bone went to the, to the elders, but mainly Brian, to see if I could teach here, I said to the Lord, I said, do you want me to teach here? That was my question. And then I asked him, I said, well, then you confirm that you want me to teach here. So I'm reading the book of Chronicles. Now listen to this. And I'm reading through the chapter 28, and this is the word, the rhema, that came to me. And you tell me if I'm supposed to teach it. And David said to his son Solomon, Be strong and courageous and act. Do not fear nor be dismayed, for the Lord my God is with you. He will not fail you or forsake you hope until all the work for the service of the house of the Lord is finished. So they were building the temple when that verse came out. So I underlined it. G generally, I date it when God speaks to me. Now, he speaks to me through devotions. He's spoken to me through bumper stickers. He's sp spoken to me all the ways. But the fact is, God speaks, and he's still speaking today, and he will speak to you. Now, let me tell you why you don't hear him. Number one, you're disconnected. Or you're too busy on that phone. I'm serious. Uh, the people today have no idea how to get quiet before God. And when you sit before God, he doesn't always start speaking to you immediately. It takes time. And he also, I will just be reading my normal Bible reading, and he might speak to me. But he doesn't speak to me every day. I mean, I don't have a word of the Lord every day. But I read the Logos every day. And something will jump out at me, and I'll know that is God speaking to me. And I have words for over 45 years that I have dated that have come true. They come true because I, Isaiah 55 says that his ways are higher than ours. His thoughts are not our thoughts. He says, but his word never returns void, but that it accomplishes that for what it is sent. Now, I want to say something. If you want to hear God like you can hear God, you have to belong to God. You also have to be surrendered to God. I told you last week in the book of Romans, the first 11 chapters are about how God saved us and all the doctrine, all the theology. It's one of the greatest books in the Bible that Paul ever wrote. But... In Romans 12, it says, therefore. Now, how do you respond to God's love? How do you respond to his ordinances or his statutes, his commandments? You offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And he says, and don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know the good, acceptable, perfect will of God. God has a will. His will is that you surrender everything you are and have to him and then you become dependent on him we are told today you need to be in control of everything in fact most of us are controllers until god breaks the control in you he'll do something that said i can't fix this one and then let me tell you something he will give you such power to live this life that you won't even believe it. I has not seen nor ear heard nor entered in the heart of man the wonderful things that God will do or has done for those that love him. All right, I gave you notes on, on communication and on the God's word, but also go on to the next one, honey. They're the two words, the logos and the rhema, and they're out there, and they're also digitized, and it's my fault they got there late. Shelly dared to, lose, to leave town, 
and she dared to leave me at that computer trying to do this stuff by myself. And I want to tell you something. If it weren't for God, I wouldn't have been able to do any of it. But it's in the computer now. So you can, if you want to, you can print it off. But, I, but Robert Stowe made some copies for y'all out there so you can pick up copies of this. All right, go to the next one, please. God's Word. Now, this is the result of your studying the Word of God, the Bible. It produces results, carries a cost, brings life, changes lives, tests us, requires understanding, holds promises, gives guidance, and requires meditation. I want to tell you something. You can't give him a 15-minute time limit. I mean, you, that's insulting, really. And I know, I know that I started the discipline of, here, of sitting before God when I was in my early 30s. And I had young children, and I had a lot of things to do. And so I was getting up at 6 and couldn't get it all done. And so I remember praying one night, and the Lord said, well, get up earlier. And I thought, 5? And then it became 4. And guess what? I got done what I needed to get done, I developed a discipline of being with the Lord and hearing his voice. And I told you last week when Pat Paderewski said he hadn't practiced his piano one day, he knew it. The second day, he said the, children, the family knew it, but the third day, the world knew it. And that's the same thing with God and your time with him. He is a jealous God. He expects you as his child, and by the way, it infuriates me to hear at funerals that you're all God's children because you are not. You are not all God's children. You're all God's creation. You are only God's child if you have been born again by God's Spirit, and that's the gospel. And I almost had a heart attack. I was at a funeral Sunday, no, Saturday, and I wrote the service, and I was so angry by the time the pastor delivered it, he said, you're all God's children. And I went around to the reception. I said, you know, you're not all God's children. I said, actually, unless you're born again, converted, regenerated, then you're God's child. But you have to be born again by the Spirit to be a child of God. He is your creator. He is not your father unless you are his child. Do you get that? So don't listen to that claptrap anymore. All right, uh, <clears throat> we're moving on now, and we see in, in Exodus 16, we're going to see that uh, they come out, and God has become their healer, and he's taught them. He said, if you'll just hear my voice, saying the same thing to you today, if you'll just hear my voice, if you'll just listen to me, I'll guide you. And he's guiding them now, you know, by a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And that cloud is going to settle on the tabernacle. And oh, when we get there and he starts directing them through the desert and goes with them, he'll have that cloud and it'll start rising. And, and those two million, not counting the children and the wives, that will, they'll see that cloud rising and it goes so slowly. And they'll see that they're getting ready to move the camp. And so then Aaron will give the instructions to the Kohathites, the Merarites, and the Gershonites to start taking down the tabernacle. <clears throat> but the interesting thing is God is so loving that as he rises in the cloud, which is his glory, the least person miles back, I don't know how, I think if they lined them up, it would be 12 miles from side to side of that many people. But at the last little lamb, the last little person in that group that's moving across the desert, it's time enough for them to get in line and get ready. God doesn't forget one detail of what he's doing. All right, we move now to the fact he's going to provide for them. So they're complaining again, and it's been a month or maybe I, maybe two months, I can't remember. But they're complaining that they don't have any food, and they go to Moses, and Moses said they don't have any food, and Aaron, and he talked to him, and the next thing God does is he says, I bring you manna. And he said, I'm going to give you, and this, by the way, is, your, is the word of God. And God is saying to you, every day I want you to gather your bread. And John said, in the book of John, in John 6, Jesus stands up and says, I am, there's that verb, the word, I am the bread 
of life. So he brings it forth in, in Exodus 16, but in John 6, he declares, I am the Son of God through the I am statements, which I've given you. And there's seven I am statements, which are magnificent of who Jesus really is and who he, who he can be to you and for you. He, they provide manna. He tells them instructions, and some of them don't pay any attention. And so the bread, the manna turns to worms. And, and again, Moses has to say, or God says, why won't you ever listen to my instruction? And then he gives them meat at night. So he's provided water. He's now providing uh, manna, and he's provided meat for his people. God is our provider, and his purpose in bringing them out was not to take them into Canaan. That's what you've been taught, that God's taking them out to bring them to the promised land, to bring you out of sin and your trespasses, your whatever, and take you into heaven. That was not the purpose of God here. It was for him, them to come to worship him. He was making a people for himself. He was making them totally dependent on him. So many times your circumstances are going to be out of your control. And it's because God wants to say to you, come unto me, all ye that are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you. But he's going to provide for you what you're going to need to live this life until the day he takes you home. But the main thing God's caring about, beginning in the garden, I told you there were three words. There was fellowship and worship and reconciliation. And God is going to reconcile the nation of Israel. He's going to teach them to worship. Because what's the number one commandment? You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. In other words, I am the Lord Almighty that redeemed you from Egypt. I am that I am. I am who I am. I am Jehovah Rapha. I am Jehovah Roy. I am Jehovah Yira. I am the God of the universe. Now, why is he reiterating this to them over and over and over? Because they were polytheists. All the nations around them worshipped other gods, many gods. And so what he wanted to do was separate these people unto himself. He baptized them in the sea, uh, Red Sea, and then he wanted to give them a covenant, cut covenant with them. He had cut covenant one time with Abraham through circumcision. Y'all remember that one. Then he cut covenant again in, in Genesis 17. And then he did a covenant with Noah. And he, it, the covenant got larger and larger. And now he's bringing them into covenant because he's going to Mount Sinai alone with God 40 days and 40 nights. Not just to get the covenant, but to get the pattern of the tabernacle. And see, God wants them. It's not you wanting God. You're wanting God. You're not, you won't seek God on your own. It says no one seeks me. Not one, it says in the Bible. But God is seeking you. If you're here tonight, I promise you, God is drawing you through his Holy Spirit. It has nothing to do with my teaching. It is God Almighty that has chosen you to come into his presence and start talking to you about a relationship with him. So he sends them. He goes up to Sinai. And he begins to separate even the priests from Moses. And he draws Moses unto himself. And he begins to lay out the covenant, the Ten Commandments. And then he says, um, I'm going to make you my people. I want my people to prepare me a sanctuary. Why? Because God wants to dwell with you and with me. He did with the Israelites, but he set up boundaries because if they disobeyed him in any way, shape, or form, they died. Jesus had not come yet. Jesus had not been the substitution yet or the propitiation for our sins. He had not died on the cross. So God was doing everything he did do, did, excuse me, could do to make a holy people. Now, the Israelites were to be different from everybody else. And how so? They were to celebrate pretty soon. They're going to celebrate a Sabbath for the first time. Friday night through Saturday night, 6 o'clock to 6 o'clock. He gave them a different dietary laws. You're going to see after 
I think it's Exodus 17, 18, 19, 20. He's going to start giving moral and civil laws. He's going to start preparing his people. But the thing he did most of all is he wanted us to be different. He wants people to see us as not just like the world, but separated from the world, thinking differently, having a different perspective. It's so interesting how I watch the news or I watch what's going on in the world. The perspective is no more the Word of God than the man in the moon. And the sad thing is so many Christians don't even know God's perspective. They have taken on the opinion of the world, of what the media says, or what the Supreme Court says, or what the judicial, uh, I mean the uh, House or the Senate say. So what I'm asking and pleading you to do tonight is to please know the Word of God. Know what God stands for. Know what He thinks about something. I remember one time I was thinking about everybody uh, bringing God this and bringing God that. Nobody ever asks God what He wants. I mean, what if you just take Him an apple pie and you don't, He doesn't even like apples? I mean, have you ever thought about that? Uh, it, it's really audacious and it's, um, it's insulting that we don't ask God his opinion and his perspective on everything. And some things are nebulous. Some things are hard to discern. But if, if God be for us, who can be against us? And I want to tell you, this man, this, this God that we serve is so powerful, so fantastic, so um, almighty. And that's what he calls himself all through scripture. He says, I am God almighty. I am the one that redeemed you. I'm the one that brought you out of Egypt. And for you today, he is the one that has called you. He's called you unto himself. And he's saying, I am the God. I want to be the God of your life. I want to save you. I want to redeem you. I want to sanctify you. I want to set you apart. And I have a mission for you. And don't you miss it. And I told you in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, 10, that God says to you that you are saved by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. And this really makes people mad is when I tell them that I, there's not a thing wrong with putting your name on a building. But if you put it there, you've already gotten the honor that you're ever going to get. It's not going to go to heaven and it will not take you there. The only thing that will take you there is belief in the Lord Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. Don't tell me you hope you're going to heaven. I remember well, I was, y'all would know this family, and I had a Bible study at this woman's home. And she told me over and over, and I said, if you tell me you hope you're going to heaven one more time, I'm going to scream. I said, you either know you're going to heaven, there is no hope about it. There's a hope in the world that's an expectancy. But that is not the hope of Christ. Christ is our hope. Christ was made unto us all wisdom. He's the sacrifice. He's the one that makes you able to go to heaven. And when he saves you, he saves you to the uttermost. He also engraves your name on the palm of his hand. I'm telling you now, do not walk out of this room without knowing that you are going to heaven for sure. Now let's look on. Let's go to the next one. Here's the manna and the quail. And it was, as I told you, that was only a couple uh, months after God had already sweetened the bitter uh, waters of Marah. Go to the next one, please. There's the seven I am's I was telling you about. The first one is we're talking about from Exodus 16, and that is I am the bread of life, John 6, 35. When Jesus stood up and he taught, he says, I am the bread. I am the light of the world. I am the door. Now, the door is going to be the gate into the tabernacle. So God is already revealing Jesus through the tabernacle. <clears throat> I am the good shepherd, John 10. We know this one, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the way, truth, and the life. When we get to that one, when we enter in the tabernacle next week, we'll see the outer court is the way, and you have to come in one gate. There's only one way to get in the tabernacle, and there's only one way to get to heaven. I don't want to hear you tell me there are other ways. There are many ways to God because there are not. And then the truth, God is truth. And the life, you will not have life 
without God. And you certainly will not have eternal life without Jesus Christ. Lastly, I am the true vine. My father is the vine dresser. Y'all know those scriptures. All right. <coughs> <coughs> Go to the next one, please. We're going to, there's Mount Sinai. I, I could tell you the name of the place that most people think it is, and I think it's Jebel Masa. There's several places. They really don't know where Mount Sinai is, but I, I just made up a picture and put it up here. That's Mount Sinai, people, and y'all believe it, don't you? Okay. <laughs> See, don't believe everything everybody tells you. Be a Berean. Look it up. All right, go to the next one. All right, we're at the tabernacle. And understand that in the olden days, when a sheik was leading the camp and leading his people, he had a spear, and whenever he wanted to camp, he would take that spear, he'd put it in the sand, and they would build the camp around that place. But where the spear was, they would build his tent because he was the head honcho of the whole tribe. Well, God is doing the same thing. He is putting his tent in the middle of an encampment. You know, our military uh, has copied a lot of this from the Bible. And we will see, there is the gate. You can see the gate. And there's only one way to get in. And this gate is the same color of some of the coverings and certainly the, tent, the veil inside, inside the tabernacle. This is the tabernacle. This is 75 feet across, and this is 150 feet here. And we're going to go into more details about the construction, and Tom is going to have to instruct me with some of the words of the construction. He's my contractor, and so I'll, I'll get him to help me with some of that. But y'all can see the brazen altar, the laver, and then the door goes in here. But this is, you know, the psalm enter into his gates with thanksgiving, into his courts with praise. What do you think that is? That's the tabernacle. All these years you thought, you didn't probably think about it at all. You just sang it or read it. But there it is. And this gate is the only way. If anybody crawled over or tried to get in any other way, they would die instantly. Now, uh, God put this tent in the middle of the encampment. Go to the next one and I'll show you this. Now, you remember the 12 sons of Jacob. Remember, his name was changed to Israel, and he had 12 sons. Okay, I want you to notice something. This is incorrect. Judah should be here. Uh, we have, this is the eastern gate. This is the western. This is the northern, and this is the southern part. This is the way it was laid out. Notice the word east. It was east that the garden was built. Jesus will be coming back where? East. All right, and look here. This encampment with these three tribes were at the eastern gate, and actually Judah needs to be in the center because who came from the tribe of Judah? Jesus. He was an unusual priest because all the priesthood descended from Aaron. That was the Aaronic tribe. There are three priestly tribe. There are three priesthoods, which we will go into later. This is fascinating. All right. These are all the tribes: Gad, Simeon, Reuben, Benjamin, Manasseh, Ephraim, Dan, Asher, Naphtali. And I want you to notice here: Moses, Aaron, and the priest, that is the Levites, his sons, camped here. Right here are the Levites of the Kohathite tribes. Here are the Levites, Gershonites, and here are the Levites and the Merari tribes. And we're going to go into all their different duties. They all had different duties when they camped, when they moved. They had certain assignments in the tabernacle that they had to do to take down the tabernacle or to construct the tabernacle. Go to the next one, please. This is even a better uh, uh, picture of it. So you see here, here's Judah. And God had them number the tribes. Issachar had 54,400. God is such a God of detail. It, the, he's not a God of confusion. It's you that's confused. He is not confused. All right, we see here that they each had a flag, which we'll talk about more. And then, as I said, here's the gate. 
And this is the way the people that brought their offerings came through the gate. And they would bring their offerings of oxen or turtle dove or pigeons or uh, 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 cows, rams, sheep, etc. And we're going to talk about each one of those offerings and why it was so important. Another thing, when you come through the gate, that you see, the first thing you're going to see is the brazen altar. Some translations say brass or brazen. Some say bronze. I read up on it. I like the brass idea better, but the truth is I don't think that the brass could have tolerated the heat of the fire. I think bronze could tolerate the heat better without melting. I, 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 I just remember reading something about that. But you need to understand that all this out here was bronze and acacia wood. The brazen altar was bronze on the outside and acacia wood inside. That's an indestructible wood that grew in the desert. Also, uh, we're going to see that the bronze represented judgment. Bronze or brass in Scripture represent judgment of God. We deserve the judgment of God, but because of the sacrifice, we get the mercy of God. Lots more detail about all this. Then you'll go to the labor, which the women donated. And they donated their mirrors. And they, were, they made a huge labor. And the priests, that is, the priests that were under uh, Aaron would wash before and after touching the sacrifice. And they had to wash again before they go into the door of the tabernacle in here. No common person was ever allowed in there. And also, this separates the holy of holies from the holy place. So here's the way, the truth, and the life. Here's the um, body, the soul, and the spirit. And our God would be over this piece, the Ark of the Covenant, and he would be the Shekinah glory of God, would be that pillar, that, and it would light the whole tabernacle. The only light that was in this section was the lampstand, the seven lights of the lampstand, which we'll talk about in detail as we go. All right, I told y'all, we're about through, ha ha, 25 to 8, um, and I want to tell you this. I had told y'all two weeks ago that uh, the first person I ever led to Christ was a girl named Carolyn. And I was teaching Bible at First Presbyterian Church, my, I think one of my first studies. I think the first study I ever did was Ephesians, and the second one was Revelation. Now talk about audacity. I think I'd been born again three months, and I taught the book of Revelation with Dan LaFarre. And that was, that was something, the two of us. And we had all these Davidson people in there because, you know, if you're Presbyterian, you have to go to Davidson. If you're a Methodist, you have to go to Duke. You know how we are. But anyway, uh, I was teaching Ephesians or something, and this young woman came in, and she said, uh, when I finished, she said, I, I want what you have. And I said, well, I don't know what I have. She said, you have a joy of Jesus. And I said, well, she said, I want that. And I said, well, you can certainly have the joy of Jesus in your life. And, and she said, well, how do I get it? I said, well, you bow your head, and we will accept Christ as your Lord and Savior, and we will believe what he did on the cross for you, and you will be regenerated. You'll be born again. So she did that. Well, it turned out, as I told y'all before, she had been clinically depressed, could hardly get out of bed for somehow she got to that Bible study, had two little boys. She was under psychiatric care, etc. And after she was born again, she literally never had depression again. That is not true of everyone. I'm just giving you this as an example of what God did with this woman. Uh, she then went home and told her husband about this. Her life so changed that he gave his life to Christ. Well, from there, they moved to Michigan. Uh, they moved to uh, New Jersey. They moved to Brazil. They moved to California. They moved to Reynolds, uh, Oconee Reynolds in Georgia, et cetera, et cetera. But I kept up with them. We were very, very close friends. And 
she, we grew together. I had already, I had been with Christ maybe four or five years by that time, I believe. And she, or at least she, I was that much older than she was. But the point I wanted to tell you was she glorified Christ. She died last July, but she had been diagnosed. Her husband called me last March and said she has three brain lesions. The only place they could treat her was Emory. And said they had a protocol there, but there was no cure for the kind of brain cancer she had. And and so he called me to say, would you talk to her? And I had been down to see them four years before. Every place she had been, she taught Bible studies. She led hundreds to Christ. She became an officer in CBS, taught. She was an assistant teaching director. No matter what country or place she was, she always glorified Christ. And the thing is that makes me so happy is I led her to Christ 40-some years ago. She died in July, but she died honoring Christ. And I remember talking to her and feeling the joy she had. And we would laugh on the phone. And I was thinking when I first came to teach y'all two times ago, and I said, this is really supposed to be a journey of joy. And the reason it's so joyful is Jesus Christ became flesh and tabernacled among us. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. True, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with us in the beginning, and in Him was light, and he, that was the life of all men. This Christ is a thing of joy. He came that you could have life and have it abundantly. And I want you now to bow your heads. In the name of Christ, we come to you tonight, Lord, so grateful, so grateful for your word, the Biblia, the book. We're so grateful for the Alpha and the Omega. We're thankful for Je Jehovah Roy, Jehovah Yera, Jehovah, uh, Jehovah Rapha, and Jehovah the who I am, I am who I am. I am have sent you. I am will save you. I will send my son, my son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for each of you, shed his blood and for your sins. As John said, behold, the Lamb of God who taketh away the sin, not sins, the sin of the world. Father, tonight I ask that everyone here would bow their knees and their tongues confess you are Lord of their lives, that they would see they have been called like the Israelites. They've been baptized through the Red Sea, but we have all become grumblers. We're critical. We, Father, we don't spend the time with you. We ask your forgiveness tonight, and we ask that you will do a new thing. Behold, I do a new thing. Do you not perceive it? I will bring streams in your desert, forget those things behind, I will press forth to the mark of my high calling in Christ. Father, tonight I'm asking that every person here receive you as their Lord and Savior and that you will give them the hope of not only heaven, the real hope of heaven, that you will fill them with the Holy Spirit, seal them for redemption, Father, and give them a joy like they've never had in their lives. In the name of Jesus and him who's able to present us blameless before the throne of his glory with exceeding joy, we give you all honor and praise. Amen. <laughs> My voice held out, Henry. Y'all can go. I can't say another thing. <laughs> <laughs>